All right, good morning. I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Arun Gupta. I work for Amazon. Um, and today we'll talk about how do we do machine learning using Kubernetes. Okay, that's sort of the focus going to be. Just by a show of hands, how many of you are using Kubernetes in some shape and form today? Just half the room. How many of you are using some sort of machine learning today? Oh, quite a bit, actually. Surprisingly, a lot more doing machine learning than Kubernetes. So this, you may know exactly what this is about then. You know, I just want to give a brief overview of what we see machine learning as. So if you think about it, long back, you know, when we learned how to ride a bike, you know, how did we learn how to ride a bike? You know, a friend or a brother or you know, a mom or a dad or somebody helped us say, you know what, hey, jump on a bike, kick the pedal, balance it out, and then learn. And so we build that sort of a mental model in our mind, and that's how we're going to learn it. And now we are taking a right turn, so we turn the bike right. We're taking a left turn, we turn the bike left. We are climbing up, we pedal harder. That's again a mental model that we are building. We're providing all of that, what we call as a training data that is given to us, and then we are building a model out of that. Imagine that being translated, all done using machines. So that's what we're doing. So essentially there is a training data. The training data you know, is fed to a program which is running the algorithm, which is consuming that training data, and then generating a model. That, okay, here is the model gonna be, okay? And then, once you have done the training, then you give it a test data, that okay, I've created a model, let me run a test data which is separate from the training data, and I'm gonna give it that to my algorithm as well, and see how well my algorithm performs. A lot of it is about uh, accuracy. So you literally keep training your model until you have closer to 90% accuracy in most of the common cases, and then, the speed with which your algorithm runs is super important as well, because you're really looking to train that model. You're hopefully not taking it days, not weeks, certainly. You know, the general estimate that we have seen when we talk to data scientists and our customers, they want to be able to run training of their models in a day, sometimes twice a day. And I'm not talking about 24 hours, I'm talking about eight hours. So think about four to six hours is sort of the optimal time they don't want to go beyond training. And we'll get into how do we get to that part of the training. But essentially, the optimization of algorithm is super important, okay? In terms of machine, a simple use case is, I want to give you an image, and I want you to tell me if there is a human in the image. And if there is a human, is the human, what kind of gender the human has? Then I want you to be able to tell me, is it smiling? Is it crying? Is it frowning? What kind of expressions that that person has? So I want to be able to tell me all those characteristics of that human being. That's a model that you could, for example, create. Now, once you have created a model, then your next goal is inference. And what that means is, I'm going to put that into production. And multiple ways you can put that into production. The simplistic way, have a simple HTML page or a website by which somebody else can upload their own image, and now they can say, make a prediction on this. Or, you know, Alexa is a great example. For example, you know, every morning my son gets up, you know, we are, hey, this is Bay Area, so what is the Warrior's latest score? You know, that's the question he asks. And that's all running using a pre-built model that is sitting in the background that is actually understanding his request and the inference is happening and the response is returned back. So back to our example, somebody's gonna give our input data, which is sort of an image, completely separate from training and test data, and then you make predictions. Machine learning, end of the day, is about how good are your predictions, okay? So that's sort of a quick machine learning 101. Now, for the folks who don't know about it, that's how, you know, so the key elements over here are training data, test data, the training module, which is where your code is running, which is where the data scientists do the experimentation with the algorithms, create a model, and then you do inference over there. Now, you may be surprised Typically, 60 to 80% of the time in machine learning is really spent on getting the right training data. And how do you make sure the training data is accurate? How, how do you make sure that this is classified? How do you make sure this is tagged properly? That how do you make sure that when I'm gonna put this model into production, I wanna be able to have, make sure that, for example, if you were to classify a smile or a grin or a frown, those different kind of expressions, Lots of ways, you know, so the lots of training data need to be provided. You need to provide, you know, data for a kid, for a people of an older age, you know, 
different gender, different color skins, different color tones, different times of the day. So imagine the amount of training data that you need to provide so that your real world accurate, um, production is ag more accurate. Now, how do we look at, how does Amazon look at machine learning? Now, so we really look at uh, machine learning essentially as three layers. Uh, the bottom layer is really meant for expert machine learning developers, pr practitioners, who knows exactly what they want to do. So they know exactly the kind of infrastructure they want to stand up, whether it's on the top of your P2, P3 GPUs, because the GPUs have lots of cores, and that's basically how you're running your um, algorithm. Um, this is not to be read, actually. It's just kind of indication over here. If we turn down the room lights, that might help. So if somebody can, I don't, oh, there you go. Is that any better? Yes. In the back of the room? Yes. Okay. All right, cool. Thank you, sir. Oh. <laughs> this is like, like, it's like a movie now. <laughs> I'm okay with that if people are okay with that. All right, cool. This is a nice movie. You know, make sure you don't fall asleep. <laughs> this is right before lunch. So it should be all right. So um, on the right side, you know, we have a bunch of you know, CPUs, GPUs, the most intense amount of you know, infrastructure that we can provide to our customers. And then, of course, there are a lot of frameworks that these data scientists like to run, whether it's TensorFlow, MXNet, PyTorch, or interfaces on top of that, like Keras. So that's the bottom layer. You know, these are for, meant for machine learning practitioners. Come in the middle layer is where we have a managed service. This is uh, Amazon SageMaker. You know, this is a fully hosted service. You know, we provide data tagging, classification. We provide Jupyter notebooks. This is what the data scientists love in terms of their experimentation part of it. Then we provide training, optimization, deployment, and full management of your service. So if you want to get started with machine learning, this is where our customers love it, and they easily get started with Amazon SageMaker. And last but not the least, at the very top is what we have, what we call as AI services. Now, these are cognitive services because they have a resemblance to human cognition. So this is where exactly we can do things like uh, recognition, where you can give me an image and I can tell you what kind of, you know, is, is, it a, is there a person in the image or is a person smiling or frowning and all those things. That's where things like Lex and Polly sit in there, which is sort of the back end for Echo. Every time you make a request to Echo, you know what, tell me the weather today, tell me the news today. So it's basically listening to your, to your uh, words coming out of your mouth, is translating that, doing a natural language processing, then converting it back into a command, then the command gets executed at the back end, which is sitting in the Amazon servers, then the response comes back, then basically a text response comes back, and then it translates it back, and then it reads it out to you. So that whole thing, is sort of running machine learning at the back end. What customers don't realize, how many of you are Amazon.com customers? Yeah, pretty much 80, 90% of the room. Now, every time you buy something on Amazon.com and you see a product recommendation, that is machine learning running at the back end. Every time you order a product on Amazon.com, behind the scene, in the warehouse, as the bots are optimizing their way so that they can pick the actual product and bring it to the front so that it can be shipped, that's running using machine learning. The drone delivery that we talk about is again using machine learning. So we have been doing machine learning for over two decades. It's becoming a more of a commodity, and this is sort of the way we look at the stack today. So once again, bottom layer is for the machine learning practitioners, expert developers. ML services, which is a managed service, is for you know, customers to get started. And at the top layer, you don't even need to know that this is machine learning. I just want to do a thing, just make it happen for me. Now, Often when customers look at machine learning, they say, hey, you know what, I'm looking at TensorFlow and I'm good with it. But what you need above and beyond that stack is really a very deep storage and analytic stack as well. Because end of the day, if you are running on that database, you know, which is basically storing your data, or you're running on a file system, you need that high throughput and low latency on your entire model. If you're doing real-time analytics, you need that service. You don't want to do the undifferentiated heavy lifting. Let me figure out how I'm going to set up my service to do the real-time analytics. Let me invoke a service which will do the analytics for me, which can handle billions of you know, requests per day, and will generate the results for me, and that will feed into my model. So always when you're looking at your machine learning stack, 
not only look at sort of what stack you're going to use, the framework you're going to use, but also on the storage and the analytics side of it. Now, where does Kubernetes fit into all this? Kubernetes fits in very well at the bottom layer itself. And that's where a lot of our customers use it quite heavily. Um, so it's very much on the do-it-yourself kind of a realm. So customers you know, who want to do it on their own, who are using TensorFlow, they're running TensorFlow on top of Kubernetes. They're running PyTorch, Selden Core, all of these different frameworks on top of Kubernetes. So these are the customers you know, who want to do it by themselves. Okay? So let's take a look at it. Why machine learning on Kubernetes? Three reasons. You know, um, and this is what Kubernetes is really good at. So first one is, of course, um, composability. If you think about machine learning is about um, data ingestion, data analytics, data tagging, data classification, all sorts of data processing capability. And then it's about how do you do training? And then how do you do inference? All of these are potentially different microservices. And this is one thing that Kubernetes is really good at, how it can compose those different microservices and give you an entire application. And each of these microservices can evolve independently in terms of what needs to happen. So composability is a big part of it. The second part of it is portability. You know, the same Kubernetes that runs on your desktop is the one that runs in your on-prem, is the one that runs in the cloud. So that portability is super important. You know, I don't want to relearn my skill if I am doing something on my desktop, then I'm going onto the cloud. I want to repurpose those skills. I want to repurpose those part spec or deployment specs that I'm generating across my different compute environments. And last but not the least is scalability. Kubernetes has some inbuilt facets, inbuilt capabilities like you know, cluster autoscaler or horizontal pod autoscaler which allows you to automatically scale your cluster and the number of pods that are running in your cluster, which gives you that ability to, my machine learning inference is going crazy, a lot of customers coming in, I need to do a lot of serving, scale the cluster. Now, the way we, our customers run, you know, our, uh, on, uh, if you think about it, more than 50% of Kubernetes that runs in the cloud runs on AWS. That's for the latest uh, CNCF survey. So Kubernetes is an open source project that sits in Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Um, and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation runs those surveys on every six month basis. For the last survey, more than 50% of Kubernetes runs on AWS. And when it runs on AWS, there are two ways customers do it. One is self-manage, where they bring their own Kubernetes. And the other way is Amazon EKS, which is our managed service. Now, Amazon EKS also provides you 100% native upstream Kubernetes. There is no forking, no branching, no internal version. It's 100% upstream Kubernetes. And at this point of time, we offer Kubernetes 114 in the cloud, okay? So what does it give you? As part of Amazon EKS, we give you a managed Kubernetes control plane. If you think about what is Kubernetes, Kubernetes has two components. One is a control plane, and one is a data plane. Now, control plane is the one that manages the data plane. Now, your containers run on the data plane. In the control plane is where all of your masters and controllers and your HCD is running. That is the job that AWS takes care of managing it for you. And the data plane, you bring your data plane. That means you bring the EC2 armies and you attach them to the data control plane, and that makes your cluster. Okay? So we provide a fully managed control plane you bring the data plane, and that makes a cluster. As I said earlier, we provide 100% native upstream experience. So if you are looking at, you know what, hey, Kubernetes is hard for me, but help me run it in the cloud, and that's exactly what we give you with Amazon EKS. Just like any Amazon service, you know, this is a platform for enterprises to run their production-grade workloads. I like to call out that Illities that you expect from AWS service, whether it's reliability, scalability, high availability, security, any of those capabilities are all available to you. We have lots and lots of customers running Amazon EKS at a huge, unimaginable scale, and it's just working out very well for them. And last but not the least, um, it's very easy um, to integrate with other AWS services. So things like, you know, if you want to run 
the way we do security in uh, AWS is using IAM. So we have an IAM authentication uh, capability as part of it. The way the logs are being done is done on CloudWatch. That capability already exists. If you are giving any command to create or tear down a cluster, those are again audited. They, they, can, they can be logged to CloudTrail for you know, auditing purposes. So all of those capabilities, the integration with existing AWS services is available to you. Okay. Now, how do you start with Kubernetes in AWS? That's the example that I'm going to be using here. So uh, EKS Cuddle you know, is a CLI that is created by one of our partners, uh, Weaveworks. Now, EKS Cuttle is a CLI by which you can very easily get started with Amazon EKS. So if you're on a Mac, literally brew install EKS Cuttle, you download the CLI, and then you say EKS Cuttle create cluster. That one command create a Kubernetes cluster for you. Yes, it has the predefined number of worker nodes. It has the predefined army that you want to use. It has a predefined uh, region that you use, predefined cluster name. All of those can be overridden using you know, simple command line switches. But it's very easy, and that is, this is the official CLI, even though created by Weaveworks, but this is the official CLI, which is now being used by all of our customers, and also part of the formal documentation um, on our docs website. So how do we start? Well, the way we start is we just install, brew install, Weaveworks, tap, EKS, cuddle. We get the CLI. And then when we fire up the command, it says EKS cuddle create cluster. And as I was saying earlier, it gives you auto-generated cluster name. It gives me two M5 uh, large instances. So basically a two-node cluster. It gives a predefined army. And this is important because what we give you is a Linux, uh, Amazon Linux-based army, but you still have the capability to bring your own army. So if you want to use a Ubuntu-based army or a CoreOS-based army or whatever-based army, we have open source the Packer scripts the way we built our own army, so you can bring your own army as well. Region, VPCs, all of that capabilities are default for you. And a simple customization. Now, if I want to run using a GPU-powered cluster, because that's the kind of cluster that I want to use for training, then I will just specify the G, uh, node type, and then I'm good to go on that, right? So let's take a look at it, how I'm going to set up my Kubernetes for um, machine learning. So in this case, um, inference, if you think about it, is a long-running job. Okay? Typically, as we said, it takes a few hours. Now, in this case, I'm setting up one cluster, which is a training cluster. And I have three P3 instances, which is a GPU power instance. And that, those three P3 instances are set up in a cluster autoscaler. What that means is if an instance goes down, the cluster will make sure that the instance comes back up again, because it will make sure that the three instances are running at a given point of time. And there are also facets that you can set up over there by which the cluster can grow up and shrink down based upon the usage. And we'll talk about that in a bit second. Okay? Then I have another cluster for inference. So one separate cluster for training one separate cluster for inference, okay? There are reasons why, would you, by which, by why uh, you would use this. Um, you would not want to run your training application and inference application on the same cluster because the set of customers that you are interacting with are completely separate. So, for example, this is maybe a target for data scientists and those may be for your end users. That may be a public-facing cluster. This may not be a public-facing cluster. So there are reasons on why you would run one data pattern versus the other. So now, how do you do your machine learning on this? Your training data, which we talked about, sits on an S3 bucket or wherever you, know, you want to run it. Your algorithm, the data scientist, the one that has written a Python algorithm or an R algorithm or a Java algorithm, is packaged as a Docker image, deployed as a manifest, Kubernetes manifest, on your Kubernetes cluster, which is then reading the data and creating a trained model. Remember, we talked about the optimization and the accuracy of the model and the training data. All that is done, and your trained model is again exported to an S3 bucket. Then finally, you have similarly the inference code, and the inference code is running on a P2-based cluster. And remember the difference here. We're talking about a P3 and a P2. So we're always, always you know, cautious about how much cost 
how much does it cost to a customer? So P3 is, P3 is a bit more expensive um, GPU, but it may be okay for you as you're doing training for it. You may not wanna use P3 for an inference. You may wanna use P2 for an inference, which is a slightly cheaper. Or there are ways by which you don't have to use a GPU. You may be okay with using CPU, for example, for inference in that sense. But eventually, what you do is, this need is being served by your production users. So your production users are the ones that are accessing the application, running on your inference cluster, and then that is what is using the trained model to do the prediction for you. Okay, so that's, that's one of the ways, that's one of the design patterns that we have seen how our customers use it. This is what we call as a dedicated Kubernetes cluster. So there is a dedicated Kubernetes cluster for training and a dedicated Kubernetes cluster for inference, two separate clusters. Now, how do we get started with this kind of a pattern? Again, as we were talking, we would use EKS Cuttle CLI. So in this case, I'm saying EKS Cuttle create cluster, give it a cluster name, the number of nodes, and the node type. That's all I need to do. Okay, so that's my training cluster. And similarly, I can create my inference cluster. EKS Cuttle create cluster, cluster name, number of nodes, and the node type, P2X large. Now, is that the only way? You know, end of the day, I wanna really put all the code even the infrastructure code into my Git repo. And these CLIs are not like very, I mean, they're friendly, good for the first time, but EKS Cuttle also support a configuration file. So what you can do is you can store that configuration file into your Git repo, and then you can say, hey, give the command EKS Cuttle create using that configuration file create my cluster. And I'll show you an example of configuration file in a second. Let's look at my second design pattern on how customers are setting it. Now in this case, what customers are doing it, they are setting up a single cluster. In that single cluster, they are setting up two separate node groups. One node group for training and the other node group for inference. And how do they identify the different node groups? Well, these are two separate node groups, first of all. But first node group has a label on each of the node, node colon train. And similarly, second node group has a label on it, role colon inference, okay? And that's the standard capability that Kubernetes has here. Now, how does my machine learning work in this case? Once again, I have my data in S3 bucket. I do the train model, which is now targeting towards a training node group, not in the cluster, but training node group. And then the train model is again fed back to my inference, and then the customer gets it. The big difference that you want to understand over here is, in this case, when I'm deploying my code, either my training code or the inference code, I need to use node selector or node affinity as is being called, and that node affinity really allows you to really target it to the node group, whether it's the training node group or the inference node group. And this pattern is what we call as a unified Kubernetes cluster. So this is one Kubernetes cluster with two separate node groups, and each node group, as you realize, is also running by identified by an auto scaling group. And that auto scaling group really allows you to shrink and scale the cluster accordingly. Let's talk about a little bit about, you know, how can we create? Remember, we talked about the configuration file earlier? This is an example of a configuration file. In this case, I'm saying, hey, I'm using a v1 alpha 5. So the configuration file is, of course, API version. You know exactly this is the version I want to use. And then you put some metadata over here, which is a cluster name and all. And then you have two node groups, ng train and ng inference. And then you can specify the instance type and the desired capacity. So very standard way. All of this code can be checked into your Git repo. And then if you have EKS Cuttle installed, then you say EKS Cuttle, use this configuration file, create my cluster, and I'm done with it. So EKS Cuttle, create cluster point to the config file, and that creates your cluster. So that's very straightforward here. <clears throat> Let's take a look at 2B, a slight variation of the example that we saw earlier. I have a training cluster, I mean a training node group in this cluster. I have an inference node group in this cluster. I have another node group which is targeted towards my applications. Because remember, applications in the previous example, for example, when we were talking about, only training and inference was happening. You may need a separate node group or a separate cluster for application where you are accepting the input from the customer 
and then feeding it to the inference. In this case, all of that is happening in the same cluster. So I'm having a training and an inference and an application node group in the same cluster. One of the big advantages of this is because all the node groups are running in the same cluster. So this is, think of it as a one big monolithic cluster, but you provide unified monitoring across the different node groups. So very straightforward in that sense. And again, we have seen both the design patterns among a wide variety of our customers over here. Once again, you use the node affinity to target the job to a particular node group, a unified Kubernetes cluster. So now let's talk a little bit about the auto scaling group because this is such a fundamental part of you know, how you set up your job essentially. By default, Kubernetes does not have you know, an auto scaler installed. And by auto scaler, what I mean is that if you think about you're deploying a pod to your Kubernetes cluster. Now, the pod has a container, and the container runs on a node. So it's a very node-centric architecture in that sense. You know, you need to have a certain number of nodes. So, and your, the ability to run the number of pods is restricted by the number of nodes in your cluster. And that's where you install tools like Cluster Autoscaler, which is a standard tool, by the way. And what it does is it takes a look at how many pods are weighted to be running, how many pods are already running, and that cluster autoscaler automatically shrinks, I mean, expands and shrinks your cluster based upon your number of pods, okay? Now, if you think about it, by default, Kubernetes is very well suited for burstable workloads. That, hey, I got a microservice running, these are all stateless microservices, and I'm gonna fire a command, and from one pod, it's gonna go to 100 pods, and then it's gonna scale down, and then scale up, and then that's a burstable workload. So it works very well for that. Escalator is a project by Atlassian. It's an open source project, and that open source project is very well suited for batch-based workloads. And if you think about ML, you know, particularly if you are running like a four to six hour um, workload for training, that's what a batch workload is. So cluster autoscaler and escalator, those are the two different autoscaling groups. You still need to manually install them in your Kubernetes cluster. What's the main difference then, right? When in terms of cluster autoscaler, it will aggressively move your pods around. So let's say you have 10 nodes, and on each 10 nodes, you got two pods running. So it'll say, you know what, hey, these are stateless jobs. I'm gonna terminate these pods, move them to a different node, and recycle that node, because I wanna keep the cost down. On the other side, escalator, it says, hey, this job is running. It's meant to be a batch job. I'll wait for the job to be complete. I know the cluster is not optimal but the job may be running for a longer time, and I will let it run, and once the job completes, that's when I will you know, look at if the node needs to be claimed or not. So that's an important differentiation. So it's very well suited for ML-based workloads. Also, it scales up based upon metrics, the cluster autoscaler, and the escalator on the other side, it aggressively scales up. That, hey, there are pods waiting for the jobs to be run. I don't want the ML jobs to be waiting, so I'm gonna fire it up, I'm gonna scale up the cluster and run it up rather quickly. And then there are um, two similarities as well. They both take over the desired instance over the auto scaling group for the cluster, and then you can run them in the same cluster with different node groups, and this is super important. So the last point particularly, if we look at it over here, is what gives you the capability, remember the 2B scenario we were talking about? I had a training and an inference cluster, an inference node group and an application node group all running. So the training and the inference can use escalator, and the applications can actually use a cluster autoscaler. So they all can be targeted in the same cluster itself. So important part to understand. All right, so now let's take a look at it. How, what are the challenges that we're seeing with our customers you know, in setting up containers for machine learning? Um, first of all, it takes days to test and configure. You don't know what should be your base image. You don't know what framework am I gonna use. You don't know um, what version of CUDA drivers are gonna be needed for a particular GPU instance. And then what if a new version comes out? Then you can come up you know, and update the image. Are you, should you be updating the image? Or is there somebody else updating the image? What about the security? How do I make sure that when I'm running, say, TensorFlow on top of AWS, am I able to optimize that entire workflow? That's the way to look at it. 
So looking at that, uh, we announced something called as deep learning containers. These deep learning containers are customizable container images. This is what our customers are using. It's very easy to get started with images that are pre-built, and I'll show you the combinations that are already being offered to you. Uh, but these are fully configured and validated images within the AWS environment. They support TensorFlow and Apache MXNet. Now, oftentimes, customers end up using a single node for training. You know, it works for them. You know, four GPUs is decent for them. But a lot of our customers use multi-nodes you know, for training. And by that, what I mean is a single GPU or like four GPUs is not enough for them. In that case, what they do is they actually use multiple GPUs. So they have multiple nodes set up, you know, Kubernetes running in them, and then the training is happening across those multiple nodes. So that multi-node training, you know, the, it requires a different kind of framework, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But then the point is that these images are ready for single and multi-node training and inference. So these are the essentially 16 combinations that we offer as part of the deep learning container images. So if you're using TensorFlow or MXNet, if you're using Python 2.7 or 3.6, or training and inference, or CPU and GPU. So let's say um, I want to use, I'm sorry? The kind of drivers that you need to incorporate in there, the kind of bundles that you need to incorporate are slightly different. Well, again, the idea is to optimize the image size. And you know, if you bundle both training and inference, it's going to bloat up the image further. It's all about the modularity of the image. So in this case, for example, let's say I want to do TensorFlow inference using GPU using Python 3.6. There is an image for that. So essentially, these are 16 different images that are available to you. And you can choose any of them as your base image. And once you choose that as a base image, then you know whatever framework, whatever Python version you had chosen, it has been optimized, tested, with the right drivers installed. All you need to do is bring in your application code, package it up, and ready to roll. Now, the stock TensorFlow that you get from Docker Hub, you know, we did a testing with that. We only achieved 60% scaling efficiency with 256 GPUs. I mean, that's a pretty huge scale in terms of the testing. But then we have an AWS optimized TensorFlow that we are planning to uh, contribute back upstream. But that, we were able to achieve 90% scaling efficiencies. So if you're learning, if you're using say, the deep learning containers, that is already bundled as part of those deep learning containers. And that is exactly the same TensorFlow that we use within SageMaker as well. Yeah, so I mean, if you, if you keep, um, like, keep adding GPUs, how long does it take for you to train a particular model, you know, which, which, which would go up to 256 GPUs? That's sort of the idea. There's a more detailed blog on this exactly, which exactly explains on how we did the experiment. And um, I would recommend reading that, and I can share the blog with you. Let's get back to sort of our Kubernetes side of the land now. Now, if you think about, you know, Kubernetes provides sort of a standard operating layer across multiple compute environments. Whether it's on-prem, cloud, you know, desktop, you can use Kubernetes API, and that, that API is what it conforms to. Now, if you get into sort of the model training and the inference part of it, how you store your model, how you run training, what kind of GPU, CPU capability do you have, what framework you're going to use, where are you going to store the model? All of that is a very colorful environment, essentially, depending upon your laptop. Like, my laptop doesn't have GPU, or my laptop does not have access to S3. And now, if I'm running on-prem, on I may have to have my equivalent part of S3. So it becomes a complex problem if I'm trying to run machine learning. Can I use TensorFlow? Can I use AWS optimized TensorFlow on my environment? So there are a lot of choices in developers' mind, essentially. And that's essentially what Kubeflow provides. Kubeflow is a framework that comes, you know, it's a standard framework, you know, github.com slash Kubeflow, and it's a, it's a project primarily run by Google at this point of time. But that framework provides you a lot of different components that provides the standard machine learning layer on top of Kubernetes. What all does it consist? Here is sort of the quick overview of Kubeflow. So if you look at sort of in the center, there is Kubeflow. 
And on the first circle around it are sort of the core components over there. So you want to do training, it's got a TensorFlow operator over there. You want to do um, model serving, it's got TensorFlow serving, Selden serving, PyTorch serving, all of these components that can be plugged in over there. It's got tools like Qflow pipelines, because end of the day, what I want to do, I want to do an end-to-end -end pipeline. Do the training, do the inference, and then in between do the data tagging, classification, and I may want to, uh, you do things like hyperparameter tuning, where as you are running your experiments, you are tuning the hyperparameters that um, I want to run 30 iterations. I want to do 40 iterations and where the training model is a different. And typically when we talk to our customers, these hyperparameter tuning, they run thousands of experiments. So you need a capability by which you can track these experiments. That's a very standard feature. Fairing, fairing is a, a nice a two, a Python SDK that really allows you to take this end-to-end -end pipeline using just Python SDK, where you don't have to write, you know, where you don't have to kind of switch your deployment environment. So in a Jupyter notebook, as a data scientist is experimenting, you can say, write your Python code, then write some other Python SDK code, which is a fairing SDK code, which says, take the model generated by training, and then feed it into the inference code, and then take it into production. So all of that is what is enabled by fairing. And then there's some other uh, miscellaneous tools as well. And there's a capability for doing experiment tracking as well. So essentially, Qflow gives you all of these components. And this is fully customizable. That in your case, for example, as you are getting started, you may not need training, you, you, or you may not need tuning or fairing or anything else. All you need is a notebook, a Jupyter notebook, and maybe TensorFlow, and I'm good with that. So you can fully customize using configuration file on what is it that you want as part of Qflow. I was hoping to, uh, a bug literally got introduced in our Qflow implementation, so I won't be able to show you a live demo for that, um, but essentially the point is, uh, what? let's take a look at it, let's see what we can do. So the main landing page for you is really qflow.org slash docs. Well, first of all, if you go to qflow.org, that is your landing page. That is the landing page for Qflow, okay? Now, what we have done is, if you click on documentation here, then you can look at Qflow on AWS, and that's all the documentation that is available to you. That is what our team has contributed to upstream, and it gives you everything about how, do you, how can you easily get started with Qflow on AWS. Um, it talks about the deployment part of it, of course, the installation part of it. It gives you the tools that how you can easily get started with EKS Cuttle, create like an EKS cluster. So the basic installation is done. Then what you do is you download sort of the KF Cuttle. I mean, there is a Kube Cuttle CLI which allows you to manage your Kubernetes cluster. Then there is EKS Cuttle CLI that allows you to manage your EKS cluster. And similarly, there is KF Cuttle CLI which again manages the Qflow implementation in your, um, any Kubernetes cluster as a matter of fact. So in this case, what we're doing is we're downloading the kfcuttle CLI, we're installing it. This is sort of my configuration file here essentially. So if I actually go here, I'm not able to select the text here. So Let's see if I can refresh it and I can select it. No, I can't select the text. Well, let me get it from my command line here. Because I've been, I've been trying to play around with this CLI. You know, I've done this installation multiple times, but I was trying to download. So this is a bug that I need to file, actually. The binary is not executable at this point of time, but... Uh, not here. So this is sort of my main kfcuttle CLI or kfcuttle underscore AWS dot YAML. This is a configuration file that has been created. This is where you exactly specify what components can be installed or needs to be configured over here. So if I go down here, it has certain namespaces here.
I still got my customized configuration here. Here are my PyTorch, notebook controllers, Kotib, which is my experiment uh, hyperparameter tuning. Here is my TensorBoard. TensorBoard is a visualization tool. If you're running your TensorFlow um, workloads in Kubernetes, TensorBoard shows you a very nice visualization on top of that. Here is my TF job operator. This is sort of the TensorFlow job operator, which basically makes sure that the TensorFlow is installed. And in any of these components, I can easily say, you know what, don't install these. Then I got my pipeline service here. There's a small MySQL agent running in the back end. This is my pipeline viewer, pipeline UI. And here is my ALB ingress controller that really gives me access to what the, um, um, to the inbound of the uh, Qflow dashboard running on the EKS cluster. And this is sort of my um, IAM role for the data plane. So essentially, you know, we have an EKS cluster. We make the configuration changes in our configuration file. And then we say, KF Cuddle, take this and go ahead and make the installation in my EKS cluster. So once my EKS cluster is up and running, then I have Qflow up and running over there. I get my Qflow dashboard. Actually, you know what? We have something that I can show you. I have a screen snapshots. That should be fine. Browser, come on. Oh, here. So spinning wheels. Okay, there we go. Now, eksworkshop.com is something that we have built for our customers and what we recommend to our customers who want to get started with Kubernetes on AWS. This is what we recommend to all of our customers. This is what our team has built, actually. But eksworkshop.com slash Qflow. I mean, if you look at the eksworkshop.com itself, it has got a lot of, of um, uh, hands-on workshops that customers can go through. But that, that I, the one that I want to highlight on is eksworkshop.com slash Qflow. Okay? So if you look through this one here, literally click on this link here. It says, how do you install Qflow on Amazon EKS? So you download the 061 binary, essentially. Then you have the KFCuttle AWS. If you want to configure it, you can. Then you install some tools. And then you initialize uh, what we call as a Qflow app. And then within the app, then you generate the Kubernetes manifest. And then you apply those manifests into the Kubernetes cluster, which basically brings down those Docker images. Because if you remember, in the kfcuttle underscore AWS, I didn't say what my Docker image is, what should the Docker image is, where should I pull the Docker images from. All I'm specifying in the kfcuttle underscore AWS is, here are the components that needs to be installed. Based upon that, it generates the manifest, and then it applies those manifests. And in the manifest is where my Docker images are sitting, essentially. Once you apply that, um, then you can see that in your cluster, there are 32 CPUs and four GPU, and that's per node. So essentially what you're getting here is a 64 CPU and an eight GPU cluster, okay? Then you can get the ingress load balancer, and from the ingress load balancer, what you get is a Qflow dashboard. So you need to set up a namespace over there. This is sort of a default view of the Qflow dashboard. Once you set up a namespace over there, then this is the view that you get for the dashboard itself. Now on the dashboard, uh, the typical standard thing that the data scientists would do is, they would say, give me a Jupyter notebook. So they will click on the notebook servers here, and then they will set up a simple Jupyter notebook. So in this case, for example, I have clicked on the notebook server, create a new notebook server, use the namespace, create a simple notebook, 
specify some CPU capabilities for the notebook, and then the Jupyter Notebook is now ready for me to get playing with. That advantage over here is this Jupyter Notebook, because we did not configure KF Cartel at all, so all the components are available to me. That means the TensorFlow libraries, everything that I would expect for a data scientist is all available for me automatically. So now I'm going to create a new Python 3 notebook. I'm going to drop some code over there. So this is import TensorFlow STF. That's the library that is available to me automatically. I run it, and then it shows me the output. Um, if you have never played with Jupyter Notebook, you know, I mean, I, I have never played with Jupyter Notebook. I've just been playing with it for the last few months. But it's a very nice experience because from a data scientist perspective, you know, you can put your code all in there, you can run it, and you can get an instant visualization on what's really happening. So in this case, for example, I built my code over there. I dropped the code, and it's saying, all right, I'm running five training runs over here. And if you see here, is saying the model accuracy is about 87%. So it's not bad, it's not very good, but it's not bad at all as well. So uh, with each um, epoch, so to say, that we are running, it also reporting how much is the loss, how much is the accuracy. So you can say it started with 81% accuracy, and it kept going up, essentially, okay? And again, there are, um, I'm not a data scientist by any means and any standard, and the data scientist knows how to write this code a lot more beautifully, and can achieve a much better functionality with this. But this is just to prove the point that how easy it is to write the code and experiment with it, particularly with all the libraries pre-installed for you. So that's sort of my Jupyter Notebook experience. Now uh, what I want to do is I want to take that code, convert it into a Docker image, and really run it as a Kubernetes pod. Okay? So that's where we say, OK, I'm going to use this as a base image, which basically uses, uh, in this case, I'm using TensorFlow as a base image, but I could have used very well the deep learning container image as a base image as well. So you push that image, you have the S3 bucket, because in that S3 bucket is where I'm gonna store my data. So you set up the AWS credentials. Now that is important to be done, because essentially, as my model is running, is gonna be saving the data into the S3 bucket. So I need to give the credentials to the application code so that it can store the data into the S3 bucket. So I set up my credentials. Then I have a MNIST training.yaml. So if we go here, oh, it downloads. Not in Xcode. Stop, 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 stop. So if you look at MNIST training.yaml in this case, so here is saying that this is MNIST training. These are the labels that I've attached to it. Here is my Python code, which is MNIST.py, because I'm going to bundle up my application code, which is my training code essentially over here. And I'm saying, uh, do the model export path here. So it's going to pick up my S3 bucket, and it's going to uh, model summary as well. It's going to dump it in there. And it's going to run about 40 epochs. And if I go down here, this is where I set up a Kubernetes secret, which is where it's going to read my AWS credentials from, and the AWS region as well. Okay. Now, one thing that I can do, though, is I can go to console. So if I go to S3 here, for example, and I have EKS ML data, and if I look at MNIST, this is my bucket here, and this is where my saved model is stored with version 1, and this is what my model is right now. And if I look at the model summary, is going to show me exactly what this summary is about over here. I can download this file, and then I can kind of view this as well. OK? So when I say kubectl get par, this says MNIST training is running. It takes a while. The complete logs are also printed out here for you. So if we look at the entire logs over here, 
is basically showing that how is using 60,000 training data to do the run. And this is epoch 12 of 40, because remember we said 40 epochs. So if we go to the bottom of it, then it says test accuracy is about 88%, and the model is saved to this EKS ML data bucket. And eventually we do the inference part of it, which is basically the same. So I have an M MNIST inference over here. Okay. Actually, I have it here already. So if we go back here. OK, so this is my MNIST inference here. So in this case, I'm saying, OK, this is a different set of labels here. Uh, these are my ports that I'm exposing. And this is my actual deployment. And in the deployment, I'm saying, again, a bunch of labels over here. And it's basically saying that, OK, uh, this is my argument here. So pick up the model base path as the same S3 bucket, but TF saved model. And it's saying, use this command over here. So all I'm using is a TensorFlow model server. And there is no application code over here, because the TensorFlow model server is baked in as part of Kubeflow and that understands the model that is exported in the TensorFlow format. So it just uses that and uses that to do the prediction, essentially. Jupyter Notebook, we have seen, is, is an environment that uh, data scientists absolutely love. You know, it's one, as I said, it's one integrated environment to do the training and the inference and get the visualization and one of the things that we've been looking at is, you know, if you have any experience on how do you take your code from Jupyter Notebook into production, that is one of the data points that we have been collecting from customers quite recently. So if any of you have experience with that, I would love to talk to you more about this afterwards. We talked about single node training and inference. Now, as we talked about distributed node training, Horoward is a framework by uh, Uber. Um, and they use a lot of machine learning. You know, I mean, every time you say um, you order a car, it's basically looking at your entire customer profile, it's looking at the entire set of customers or the drivers that are available around you, and it's optimizing. That's all done using machine learning models. So uh, this is a framework that definitely worth looking at it. A few of our customers who are running at that scale who are doing distributed node training are looking at Horoward. Now, uh, more recently, TensorFlow also has a distributed uh, training model as well, so worth looking at it as well. Um, something that I want to talk quickly about is also um, how we need a high-performance file system. So um, essentially, FSx for Luster is something that was launched by Amazon last year, and that's what, what, what a lot of our customers use. So essentially, if you have your data stored in S3, you can use FSx for Luster as a front end for it, and it gives you that high throughput, low latency kind of an input. Um, now, the way things work in Kubernetes, you need to have a CSI driver or a container storage interface driver. And so we have built a CSI driver that allows you to talk to FSx for Luster in a very upstream standard way. I'm going to skip this, and here we go. Uh, some of the advantages of running Kubeflow, and we have talked about most of these. Um, it comes with a pre-installed um, NVIDIA device plugin. You know, these are standard um, EKS uh, benefits. You can have your uh, Kubernetes API server endpoint completely hidden. You know, don't, don't have to expose it to the internet. We give you the CSI driver, logs in CloudWatch. You may want to do authentication with your, uh, for your um, Kubeflow endpoints. So we provide integration with AWS Cognito for that. Now, um, a few months ago, we also launched um, this uh, deep learning performance uh, toolkit. Um, that's what, you know, in this we provide recommendation in terms of how are we optimizing running these machine learning workloads in our environment. You know, so in this case, for example, we have seen um, an efficiency in terms of running these deep learning benchmarks on Amazon EKS and how we were able to scale up to 160 GPUs, you know, quite linearly up to 90% capacity over here. 
So the blog URL is over here. Um, I'll upload the slides on the Silicon Valley Code Camp website as well. So you will have access to all of this data, you know, um, the slides as well. So if you look at sort of how your machine learning pipeline looks like, there are a lot of stages in that. There is uh, collect and prepare training data, then you need to choose the right algorithm, then you got to figure out your training, then you got to figure out what GPU instance I'm going to use, then you need to tune and deploy your model multiple times, and there's a little bit of a trial and error over there, and then you need to manage that entire thing in um, production. So from Amazon perspective, we provide a very wide and deep stack for you, whether it's for the storage, whether it's for bringing your own algorithm, whether it's for compute capacity, whether it's for running your infrastructure at host, you know, at scale. If you want to manage service, use SageMaker. If you want to use do it yourself and bring your frameworks to Kubernetes, then Amazon EKS kind of serves that need over there. So I'm going to leave you some of the references over here. So eksworkshop.com slash Qflow is what uh, my team built, actually. Um, we're very excited to share this with our customer. We're going to be running this at uh, KubeCon coming up next month, and we're going to be doing this at reInvent a couple of times as well. So if any of you are going to be there, this will be a lot more hands-on workshop. We got a lot more code and samples uh, at AWS Samples Machine Learning Using Kubernetes. That's, again, something that I've been working quite actively on. Um, and this is the optimizing machine learning performance um, toolkit that I was talking about. So take a look at that. I think this should be useful. That's all I have.